Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 343 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah, today recording day is Thursday, February 20, not February, March 21st, 2024, and it is going to be a cool day here at the Beaver Lodge. Temperatures below zero, at least until Sunday, according to the Weather Network. <laughs> and, um, well, yesterday around the end of the day, we did have a little bit of sun that popped up to try to make the day a little bright, which was uh, actually really appreciated. So hopefully we'll have some sun today as well, too. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me as always, as you can see, is my dear friend, Mr. Grizzly. Big thank you goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. We have a little bit of a nibble for you today, but before we do anything else, let's do the most important thing we do on the show, and that's ask Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Well, Mr. Beaver, my mental health, um, you know, it's at this moment in time, right now, while we're sitting here chatting, as I stare into the camera fed all the kids and cubs i'm feeling good i'm feeling good when i woke up that was another story it's been a couple of nights of vivid bizarre twisted warped ass dreams that um don't enable me to get a proper night's sleep because they're so vivid and wicked and i wake up every muscle is is tensed and i'm sweating which is probably why i'm, I'm still so thin and lean at my age because I haven't been to the gym in a while and I can't run because my knees are shot. But uh, yeah, woke up feeling existential dread, anguish, anxiety, uh, like everything is horrible. And after, you know, take a few minutes to wake up and come out of the dreamlike state that I was in, starting to feel better minute by minute and, uh, you know, took, took the doggo out. Uh, it's minus 18 with the wind chill in downtown Ottawa right now. So we weren't out long. <laughs> she started, she saw an Irish wolfhound across the street and started to whine a little bit. So I scolded her and made her sit because I'm disciplining her so she doesn't chase after dogs. And she was shivering, but it wasn't for excitement. It was because it was cold. I'm like, all right, silly, let's go in now. And she just sort of looks at me like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my mental health is pretty good right now. Wasn't when I woke up, but it's good right now. So. Let's run with that. How about yourself? Doggos make everything yeah, better. Yeah, well, they do. They do. Yeah. Uh, I am... <clears throat> uh, my mental health is good. Uh, I am... Um, uh, I have two consecutive days off for her. Oh, soul, good, good. Which I'm actually really quite happy That's about because I am so freaking tired. Uh, but then we, uh, we go into... Um, 
we call it Hell Week. I mean, it's not really Hell Week, but Tech Week, the week that's very busy. Uh, so Saturday's rehearsal is going to be very, very, very long because we basically we get the theater on Saturday, I think, and that's when we have to like to build the right. whole set on the stage. And Wednesday is uh, dress rehearsal with audience. So um, we don't have a lot of nights in the space because you still got to do your Q to mm-hmm. Q. Uh, you have to do your uh, so and your technical uh, cues. So to make sure that your lights and sounds are coming on at the same time. And then your transitions are happening at the right time. And then you want to hopefully try to do two or three runs on the stage in costume before you have opening night with. Uh, and uh, so it's going to be long. <laughs> and you wanted like, you know, we had those couple of fight scenes and whatnot. And you want to practice them on the actual stage with the proper spacing and whatnot to make sure, you know, nobody falls right. on somebody and, or you don't trip over a prop and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then, then of course, because it's a musical, we're going to have the Britney Spears, Madonna mics. Yep. Yep. The head mics. Are glued yep. to us. So you got to test all of those. So, and uh, there's, there's well over 20 of us, so, you know, a mic test for everyone is, you know, if you, you'll put about five minutes for everybody's test, um, there's, let's say there's 25 of you, that's a lot of minutes. Now, you know, we, we don't all go in a room and stand there and go one by one and have nothing else going on. There's other things going on and you get pulled out for a mm-hmm. couple of minutes. But there's going to be like lots of stations where things are going to go on and there's going to be a lot of hurry up and wait and there's going to be a lot of time that you're going to be asked to be at two different places at once you're gonna go no somebody else has got to go before me (laughs) i'm already with costumes thank you (laughs) so yeah uh so that part is uh getting busy but there's also a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel aspect and our show is over 90 percent sold oh awesome all the seats for all the shows, 90% awesome. sold. So uh, we might completely, completely sell out, which is uh, pretty exciting because um, theater is mm-hmm. fun, but I've been in musicals where one night uh, we performed for a f- packed house of 200, right. and the very, very next night it was like six. And you have to like to put the same amount of, yeah, whether you're performing for six or two hundred, when you're performing for six, I understand that the six in the crowd are very, very oh, grateful yeah. when you put everything you've got into it. <laughs> there's only six because they know there's only six on the table in the theater too, and they try to cheer loud enough to compensate. But you, on stage, you really feel that <laughs> it's, well, it's you know you got to remember the, there's only so much energy. The that old comes adage back. from Gene Simmons, <laughs> and you know Gene Simmons. Take, take his his commentary with a grain of salt sometimes. But this one I've always taken to heart because it, it, it's meaningful, truthful, actual, and should be applied. Whether there's 10 people or 100,000, always give it your all, yep. no matter what. Because oh, every yeah. one of them will appreciate it. And here's the thing, you'll appreciate it too. Because those 10 people oh, yeah. will, will respond with joy and, and, and gratitude the same way 100,000 would. It's just a little bit quieter. Oh, yeah. That's all. Yep. And, you know, I always, almost always come out after the show, you know, try to get out of my last costume as fast as possible, put something on and go out to talk to the people that came up to, mm-hmm. to see it and, you know, thank them for coming. Because, you know, just like I do over here at the end of the show when I say the gift of your attention is the most important exactly. gift. Um, if you don't come and see the play, uh, what do we yeah. do it for? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we don't get to do what we do if uh, the audience does not show up. So it's, uh, I'm always, always, always grateful for people uh, giving uh, giving us uh, the gift of their attention and mm-hmm. their presence and their time. Because, you know, it's not like there aren't a multiplicity of other choices people could be making. So I'm, I'm looking at, just, just a sort of side part here. I'm looking at the chat, and people are talking about their age. You know, I'm 48, I'm 49, I'm 50, I'm 60, and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. And all I'm thinking is the old uh, statement of, if, if you meet somebody over the age of 45 out on a weeknight after 9 p.m., they've definitely had a nap that day. <laughs> it's true. Yep. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> or yep. the alternative would be, or, you know, some sort of, they haven't. <laughs> yes, or they haven't gone home That's yet. The other thing. That's the other thing. <laughs> so, yeah, because you you might 
and that happens sometimes. You meet somebody who's, let's go for a beer after work. Ah, you know what? It's five o'clock. Sure. Let's go for a beer. I got time, which turns into three or four more. And you've, you've, I've played you the, the Larry Miller, uh, five levels of drinking. There yes. are five levels of drinking, six if you live in a trailer park, but tonight we're only going to deal with five. <laughs> it's weeknight, it's around 7 p.m., and you get up to leave, and one of your friends, one of your unemployed friends, says, let's have another round, and it just goes on from there. Anyway, that, that does happen if you see somebody <sighs> over the age of 40, over the age of 45, out having drinks after 9 p.m. on a weeknight. One of two things has happened. They've had a nap that day or they never went home from work. <laughs> yep, pretty much. Pretty much. All right, uh, kids and cubs, some interesting things uh, are afoot. Ow. Um, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> what did you do? I hit my elbow on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, right on your yeah, funny bone, right? I'm a little uncoordinated. Yeah. Kidding, so. <laughs> yeah, I saw that look on your that face. Hurt. That hurt. That hurt. I didn't need that. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> I didn't need that. Oh, I got to tighten this thing oh, up man. again. Oh, once again, kids, we do our own stuff. Yes, and, and sometimes I don't do that very well. <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was priceless. Mm. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to watch that again once the show's hurt. over. <laughs> so, okay. if you, um, just to, so, just before we get started, if you are watching on yes. any one of the platforms available to you and you want to join in the chat with the damn fam, if you look at the screen right now, you'll see www.youtube.com backslash at True North Eager Beaver Media. If you type that into your uh, search bar that will take you directly to our youtube channel where you can join in the chat with the damn fam i'll leave that up there for a couple of minutes well while we begin the show sir please take it away all right ah uh, well um you often hear us on the show mm -hmm. me in particular uh make comments about um how the federal conservatives in particular their leader tends to abuse of the parliamentary process and thus of all the tax dollars yeah. we put in to ensure that it operates smoothly as PR opportunities. And um, I had mentioned some stuff, but you, Mr. Grizzly, took uh, some time yesterday to watch Question Period. And you may have noticed specifically what it was I was talking about when I said that the conservatives use question period as a PR and opportunity and media availability stuff and use their media availabilities as opportunities to debate rather than the other yes. way around. So he would rather debate the journalists at his press availabilities than de debate anyone anywhere, really, <laughs> because remember, he paid to get out of the debate for the leadership. Yes. And yesterday we saw a little bit on this hour's 22 minutes why it is that he might do that because he's not very good on his feet, particularly coming up with clip. Well, I have the 22 minutes clip for and, later too, by the way. Yes. And then, uh, you know, uh, we talked about him uh, taking his questions and clipping the part where he asks the question but never showing the answer. And he does a lot of posing and training and waving his arms and pointing fingers and stuff while he asks the questions and then he circulates them as uh, media stuff and then of course with those media clips he well explains how it is that the conservatives are the victim of everything yeah. today yeah. and why it is you should be mad about it and why it is that it's everybody on the left's fault and particularly the prime minister's fault and then asks for your data and asks you to open your wallet every time Every it time never fails. Um, but yesterday, you actually took some time to watch Question Period, and you saw exactly how bad it's, it is. Brutal. Please, for the kids who have not been able to tune in for a little while, or have just been too discouraged to tune in for a little while, please explain what happens when Question Period happens and conservatives start asking questions. Mr. Well, Vincent. to begin with, uh, I believe it was. I believe it was Tim Upple. I could be incorrect, okay? Because I, I I didn't catch the name when I when I clicked it on, and he was out there uh, saying rather inflammatory things and spewing lies. And the lies he was spewing was, "When are they going to end this coalition?" 
okay, for the umpteenth freaking time, it is not, by definition, a coalition. It is not a coalition. And they know it. Term. It's a supply and confidence agreement. If it was a coalition, you would have NDP members of parliament in liberal cabinet. That would be a coalition. This is not a coalition. It's a supply and confidence agreement. Number one, he uh, went on to talk about the uh, spikes in the carbon tax that is going to cost us so much money when we've already proven that isn't fucking true. Then he sat down and the leader of the opposite, the loyal opposition leader, the LOL, as I like to refer to him, got up and started to say, when are you going to spike the spike the hike and axe the tax this uh thing that 70 percent of canadians hate uh, there's there's nothing to back up that statement that 70 percent of canadians hate it number one right. number two spike the hike so you know i know what he's trying he's trying to do a spike like volleyball to knock it down but normally or spike like a railway yeah, but spike. normally when you talk about Through a spike it. in any sort of tax yep. it means it goes up when the stock yep. market spikes you make money if you own stocks in yep. certain so when it, it, the slogan doesn't really work unless you're thinking volleyball, right? So he, he must have repeated right. that. So, when are you going to spike the hike and axe the tax? Justin Trudeau, when are you going to... He must have said it four times in about 30 seconds. I, I, I literally had to turn it off. I watched the portion in French when he didn't repeat himself so much. And the portion in French, I was able to understand most of it, so that was okay. And there was back and forth between the PM and between... Um, the LOL and then it went to English and he kept repeating himself over and over again and after about 10 minutes I was like I'm out I can't take this shit anymore this is this is childlike behavior yep. all he's trying to do is get his clip for social media yep every single intervention from a conservative MP is marketing mm -hmm. branded after eight years of Trudeau da, 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 that's why we're going to axe the tax stop the crime, build the houses, whatever, whatever, fire the liar, suppress the press, blah, blah, blah. Uh, like this, and then it ends somewhere, sun somewhere in there, Justin Trudeau's not worth the cost. But those three things figure in absolutely every statement. And I think they only have like a minute yeah. and a half to, like, to ask the question. But they fit in those three things first. Everyone. So every single MP has a clip that mm -hmm. they can use. Oh, yeah. It's just brutal. I mean, even the former... We pay for that. Leader, Aaron O'Toole. Well, I was not a big fan of, but he said, you cannot govern by social media. You, you should not be using the House of Commons to get social media clips. I respect him on that because he's right. This is not good for democracy, what this party is doing. It's not. Yep. And it's another misappropriation of public funds for purely political partisan Absolutely expenses. it is, because every time they're up there, it costs us money. They're working, they're getting paid. Which adds to the whole thing where he went on about how um, <laughs> you'll have to get a job yes, instead of, you know, leeching off the taxpayer. I mean, the, the dripping with irony from the man who has worked on the taxpayer's dime for 20 plus years. Yeah. This refers to the clip that we showed, the brief excerpt of a clip that we showed of uh, uh, some comedian from this hour's two hour 22 minutes posing as someone named Dan um, in the reception line at a Pierre Polyev uh, event going up to talk to him and at first he made the joke that he really likes him and hopes that he's the leader of the opposition for the yes. rest of his life to which Pierre Trudeau said well that's not going to happen because you're 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 uh uh, uh 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 and then couldn't come up with an insult and then later on well then did said you know you know you work for the CBC, ha ha, yeah. like this. I'm going to defend the CBC so you won't have jobs, ha ha. The CBC shouldn't be spending money on comedians, ha ha. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the guy went back in line. And did it again. Basically. <laughs> and uh, asked another question. And uh, yeah, that's when the PP uh, then made the comment about, you know, he's going to actually have to work for a living and no longer be taxpayer funded, which is like, um, Bro. I get, all I can hear is like Chris Rock. Do you hear the words coming out of your mouth as they were coming out of your mouth? No, they don't. They don't. They don't. I, I have the clip. Um, shall we show it now? I don't, can we show, we can't show the No, 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 I'm going to start okay. it at the 48 second mark when he's just getting okay. in line. 
we'll just watch yeah. the interaction. The first interaction, we can watch the rest later. This is only like I don't know, twenty or thirty seconds. We saw the first. We saw the first one. Though, well, yesterday. actually, that's kind of chopped up. That was edited for time content. That, okay, that yeah. was edited. For time so content. here, let's just watch this. It's just a few seconds, and uh, we'll come back to the show. Oh, let me just fix the thing here. Yes, and then when he goes back, then the second time was the guards are putting him away. He's asking, "What will you do to make guarantee free speech?" Yeah. <laughs> as he's being carted we'll come away. Back to that later. <laughs> For those of you who didn't see it, that was a little bit of the clip. <laughs> One sec. Now I do question. There was a bit of an edit there that they cut out. I don't know. I don't know what they cut. I'd love to be able to see the raw footage because there was a jump cut there. Yeah. Yes, and I, I would love to know what took place because otherwise, the you know, there's the accusation. Well, you just did that to make him look stupid. No, he he made himself look stupid on his own. When he couldn't answer a simple question, what actually he couldn't, it wasn't even a question. He just responded, but couldn't respond to him correctly when he said, I want, wish you were the loyal opposition leader for life. Well, you, you uh, can't, you, you, I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> it's basically what he did. Yep. It was good. It, it was really good. Uh, <laughs> maybe BB doesn't realize that he's taxpayer funded. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't know that. Which would be a little frightening after holding down the job. For 20 years. For 20 years, where you're taxpayer funded. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so uh, yesterday, uh, little uh, Pee-Pee decided that he was going to stomp his little foot. Uh-huh. And... Uh, tried to pass a motion yesterday uh, that he declared to be a confidence motion uh, about axing the carbon tax. And of course, that did not work for him, as everybody could have told him mm. that he was just wasting an opposition day on that. And um, of course, uh, the Greens and the NDP and the Bloc voted alongside with the Liberals to maintain carbon regulatory pricing. So uh, since that didn't work, he's got a second opposition day, which is today, where he's just going to pass a straight-up non-confidence mm -hmm. motion, uh, which, again, is not going to succeed. So he has an opposition day. He has two opposition days. He could raise an actual question about something having to do with affordability. He could raise an actual question about something having to do with climate or the way that we pay for GHG gas emissions. He could propose another solution, ask why we're not doing that instead. Like he could go on all, all in on cap and trade or something um, rather than a fee specifically. Uh, but he didn't do that. He could have talked about healthcare. He didn't do that. He could have talked about something for the disabled community or indigenous Canadians or youth. Uh, but he didn't do that. He's just saying, I guess, I want an election. I want an election now because the polls are good for me right now. And even though we have this fixed addiction, fixed election date law, and even though we know that there's a confidence and supply agreement, hey, federal government, Justin Trudeau, now, even though you were democratically elected for five mm -hmm. years, we normally do four, but technically a full term is five yeah. in Canada. Even though you were democratically elected for the next five years, why don't you just decide to commit political suicide and have an election now? Because, well, once again, we conservatives believe Canada is Burger King and, well, we just have to belly up to the counter and order it and then we can get it mm -hmm. our way. And remember this... We want to have the election now because we think that you're weakest now. Please give us an election. That's the way That's it works. That's not how it works at all. And and this is all over the carbon tax. Remember, well, this is what yes. non-confidence voters about the carbon tax. Let's let's go back yes. in time for just a couple of seconds here, shall we? Let's go back in time here. I should mention that while our plan will effectively establish a price on carbon of sixty-five dollars a ton, growing to that rate over the next decade. I should mention that while our plan will... Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so it's basically Stephen Harper's plan. The rate of carbon right now until April 1st will be at that, uh, is at that $65 a ton uh, rate that Harper said back then would be. So it seems that the only problem that the conservatives actually have with the program is that the money actually returned, the, the money collected is returned. Mm -hmm. 
to Canadians because Harper's plan did not include that. I can't tell what the Conservatives object to about the current climate pricing scheme other than the fact that money is returned to Canadians because in all other ways, it is the same scheme as Harper said he was going to give us, which PP had no problem with. And the whole thing is that PP is framing this as, you know, we're demanding that the Liberals give us an election now because allegedly, according to us, 70% of Canadians are pissed off about this carbon thing. So let's have a carbon tax election. And it's like, um, dude, I don't know where you were the last two elections, but weren't the last two elections carbon tax elections? Mm-hmm. The first one that gave us Trudeau where he actually ran on putting carbon yeah. pricing and then we voted for him and voted for it all, along the way. And then we had you guys raised holy hell and then you brought it to the Supreme Court and then you lost. And then you tried to run on that in the next campaign. You even pretty much performed a coup on your own leader at the time, Aaron O'Toole, because he wanted to bring in some type of carbon measure. But that was really weird. It was like Club Z, the more you burn, the more you earn, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Uh, Club Z and there. Uh, yeah, which was a, a very, very, very weird way to do it. But hey, at least you kind of had this sort of kind of maybe plan. Uh, but you turfed them because of that. Mm-hmm. And now you're sitting there going, uh, now we want this to be the carbon tax election. No, no, you've had your carbon tax elections twice. Yeah, twice. Twice. The matter settled. The matter settled. But of course, you know, they spent the last eight years basically shit-talking it, and now they've got a significant portion of Canadians to, you know, somewhat agree with their position that the tax should Mm go. Uh, I guess if you lie about something long enough, you'll get a critical mass of people willing to buy it. Well, you know, that's what they're banking on, right? But the thing is, most Canadians realize we are in a climate crisis. Most Canadians understand we have problems. The wildfire season we saw last year was not like anything we've ever seen before. And in Alberta, it actually never stopped. It nope. never stopped. They were still burning. Underground, and, all went wrong. Alberta is going to be experiencing a drought this year. So, you know, there's about almost 5 million people in Alberta, and I think the vast majority of them recognize we have a huge freaking problem here because... Cattle will stop dropping dead in the fields when all they're inhaling is smoke. You're going to put them all in the barn and filter the barn? I've been in a few barns in my day. Most of them aren't exactly what we'd call um, air friendly. Mm. Mm. And we all want free range Mm. grass fed beef. Well, not all of us, but uh, uh, millions of people do. Well, when there's no grass because of the drought and they're dropping dead because of the smoke, how are we going to eat? And how are those farmers going to be able to raise their cattle when there's no cattle to be raised? Most people understand the bigger picture here. And the idea behind the greenhouse gas emissions that that Harper came up with was those who submit, uh, who emit the most will have to pay a, a, a tax on it. So the incentive is to, and, and it goes back to, it's the same thing with the 90% tax um, levy over a certain uh, income that at Eisenhower enacted in the, in the fifties. The idea mm-hmm. is if you don't want to pay the tax, well, you clean up. So you emit less carbon. So as a result, you don't have to pay the tax. It's an incentive to make you clean up your act so you don't pay it. The idea was if you earn more than, I'll say, $100 million, anything over $100 million would be taxed at the 90th percentile. So what you did to reduce your tax payment was you invested into the company. You created programs for your employees like pension plans and daycare. Well, maybe not in the 50s and 60s daycare, but pension plans, health care plans. Paid vacation. Mm -hmm. These things were not a thing in the 60s, in the 50s. I mean, we didn't get uh, two weeks mandatory paid vacation in Canada until Lester B. Pearson enacted it in, what, 1968? So the idea behind the greenhouse gas emissions tax or the carbon tax or the carbon regulatory recovery fee is for you to clean up your act. So 
if you bring your emissions below a certain target, you don't pay the tax. But they refuse to talk about that. They refuse to acknowledge the fact that this program is designed to improve your life. And most Canadians, over 70%, get more back than they pay into it. And that is a fact. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. And when the price on CO2 goes up, so does the rebate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, he's going to hold his vote. Uh, it's going to fail. And um, then he's going to send out a ton of fundraising letters stating how, you know, the Liberal NDP coalition, without mentioning the fact that the Bloc and the Greens also <laughs> voted against them, so it's pretty much everybody in the House except us, which maybe should pause us to wonder, mm -hmm. given the number of times that it happens, maybe we're wrong. Hmm. I don't know. If I had a minimum of self-awareness and if I was in an August body <laughs> that was meant to, you know, debate things and I consistently over about eight years in a row was always on the losing side of every vote, I, you know, maybe not in public because I might have pride, but I might, you know, quietly and discreetly make my way to the men's bathroom and I might go into a stall and might just yeah just give my armpits a, a bit check, of a right? yeah. sniff and just wonder, you know, may, maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. It's like if we had just a two party system, I mean, a lot of people argue that we do, but if we literally only had a two party system like the United States with only two parties represented in the House, it would be easier for me to convince myself that the other people are wrong and that I'm right. But we have five parties represented in the House. And when four parties keep on voting one way, and you have no friends and nobody to work with, and nobody who really wants to work with you either, because <laughs> you kind of give off these vibes. Um, creepy yeah. vibes. Um, wow. <laughs> I, I, I would, I, I would wonder, I, I would wonder if maybe it's time for a little introspection. From, from them? Oh, come now. No, no. Mm. Anything bad that happens in the world, somebody else did. Anything yes. good that happens but in the world, again, it just happened. Or we did it. Yeah. As evidenced by Jugmeet, who where... always takes credit for things that he says he did when he couldn't have done it on his own. Uh, and the things that he's forced everyone to do because he's such an um, intimidating figure. Well, look, I'm sure if we... If we I, I wasn't going to pass dental care, but now that you've given me that look, ooh. <laughs> look. I guess you forced my I have my no hand. doubt he can kick my ass nine ways to Sunday because he is a... Oh, yes, martial, martial arts, arts. right? I, that's, but that's not yes. up for debate. But he doesn't have the seats or the power to actually make these things happen without the liberals initiating it. Nope. So, yeah. he only has the seats to persuade or put it on the order paper. But it's like, he's not forcing, and again, like this, he, he's saying that again with the military thing, you know, it's like the, the, the Israel motion. It's like, we forced the federal government to not sell arms. And it's like, well, the way I see it is that you had a motion that was called recognizing a Palestinian state and then the liberals came in with amendments to seven of the nine portions mm -hmm. of it. And the portion about distinctly or specifically recognizing the state was sort of soft pedaled there. And you claimed you forced them. Seems that you really wanted to win on this motion and you were able, willing to bend on anything that the party, the main party that you needed to get your motion to pass so that you can go to all your party stalwarts with a fundraising letter saying, hey, look, we forced them to do this, send mm -hmm. us money. Because that's also what's happening here, let's be oh, honest. Yes. Right? Hey, 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 we're still relevant. Yes. I'm I, I'm in the back back left hand corner of the class where the teacher never sees me because she always looks right to left first. But I'm here. hey hey I I, I I forced you to do I forced you to teach us new math. Hey hey that was that was us. Anybody that was that was us. Well, I, I love this statement here. It's like the teacher still had to agree to teach it. I love right? this statement from Cassie, a farmer 
in Manitoba. If Pierre Polyev scraps the carbon tax, it won't reduce grocery prices as farmers' input costs are up 25% the last four years. We don't set grain prices. That's the grain buyers and the large grocers like Galen gouging. And you're right. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're right. And this is something that yep. will, they'll never talk about because, well, he can't upset his donor overlords. I'm not, look, every single politician, every single political party is on the hook for something to somebody somewhere. Because you don't get to that mm -hmm. position without having to make uh, backroom deals and agreements that with people that you probably wouldn't want to have a cup of coffee with, but people who are in positions of power can, can help you get to that level. <sighs> mm -hmm. So everybody is compromised yeah. to some degree or another. Period. Indeed. Period. Indeed, indeed. And speaking about our food producers because we've spoken about our farmers, but if we're sp speaking about our fishers mm -hmm. as well, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, there are hundreds of angry fishermen who have blocked the entrance to the so legislature much. in St. John's, Newfoundland over yesterday because they're protesting against regulations. I'm guessing these are provincial regulations in this case on where they could sell their catches. They want regulatory changes to allow for more competition and better distribution of catches, not and not just the lucrative snow crab catch. The fishermen had been showing up in the legislature for probably about three weeks prior to this, but yesterday a whole bunch of people showed up and they blocked access to members of the legislature in terms of getting into it. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary was brought in to help people get inside, and the confrontation did force the federal government to delay the introduction of his budget, which was supposed to happen yesterday. Organizer John Efford said, we have no competition now. The five, six big companies now who've bought up and shut down all the small plants that are around now over the last 10 to 15 years have divvied up the quotas. So they're looking for um, some fairer regulations so that they can actually get paid what they are worth, mm. much like our farmers mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. So keep your eye on that if you're out there. Um, and yes, kids, I, again, you may have seen uh, the guest in our house, the fly, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Seems to have a particular fond affection for me mm. today. Oh, <laughs> he, he, he just wants to be close to me. Okay. <laughs> it seems. Um, other news that we have uh, going on uh, because the Arrive Scam, oh, Arrive Cam. Sorry, thing. <laughs> stir it up, are you? Stir it up. Stir yeah, it up. yeah. Stir it up the pot. The, the conservatives keep on trying to make arrive scam yeah. happen. Not sure how well it's working for them. Um, but uh, let's take a look at this budget. The federal again. government. Let's take a look at the budget again. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So, according to this, their projection was fifty-four million, and it came in at fifty-five. And then there was another 6.8 million tacked on, which was not forecast because it was changes to core CBSA um, IT systems to manage health measures, measures such as random testing and contact tracing as prescribed by orders in council. So they were literally 1 million over budget, which is incredibly close to the real thing, like unbelievably close to the real thing. And then another 6.8 million tacked on, which had nothing to do with the budget it was just orders and council said oh we also need to do this so something they couldn't forecast for yeah and uh so they had the two owners of uh, gc strategies come in to testify the first one was combative the second one uh basically said didn't really know much about what was going on and didn't even bother to read the news reports on what uh, they were saying about them uh, because uh, claiming that he does mostly uh, administrative stuff uh, with regard to this particular contract. Uh, but all of this is um, it's happening concurrently with the federal government investigating how it is that it is doing procurement. And yesterday it was announced, the, the federal government itself announced that they had identified other federal IT subcontractors who have used fraudulent billing schemes, allegedly. Uh, basically, they were uh, double dipping, which is uh, basically charging different departments 
for work that was done allegedly during the mm. same hours. Interesting. So I'm not sure how you could be doing work for Transport Canada and for Treasury Board at the same time between two and five. Yeah. The same company, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So it seems that uh, these type of uh, deals, according to Procurement Canada, has cost the federal government about $5 million. The department hasn't named the individuals, but has confirmed that their security clearance has been revoked and that the case has been referred to the Mounties. Now, th- with these three cases, that makes about five cases that have been returned to the Mounties. There's the uh, what's been uh, highlighted with regards to Arrive Can that's being investigated, and that's it's being investigated at the department level, not at the prime minister's mm-hmm. office level. Uh, but what went on at the department and its uh, contracting uh, with GC Strategies and maybe other uh, subcontractors, I'm not quite sure if it applies to others. Um, then there was the revelation, rather shocking revelation, actually, that uh, the Office of the Auditor General, which had done the review <laughs> on what was happening with Arrive Can, also had two employees in its office that were earning money from government contracts entered into on the side. And they were fired from the office. And the alleged conflict of interest cases there have been also referred to the RCMP. So even in the Auditor General's office, this mm-hmm. was happening. And the Auditor General is the office that's supposed to look at these things happening. (laughs) So clearly it's a broader problem that's existed for a while, independent of party, and that this particular federal government is going to be doing something about it. Uh, The alleged overbilling from the three IT companies in question took place between 2018 and 2022. Jean-Yves Duclos, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, says that the new... uh, says, uh, quote, this has impacted dozens of departments. The overbilling, therefore, was made in a manner that took advantage of the fact that until recently, when everything was done on paper, it was difficult for departments to coordinate and share that information. So at what time did they say that they were working for you versus working for us? And are we being double dipped, double billed? So now that things are electronic, they can just like tap that in and go, hey, wait a minute. That can't be right. So. In addition uh, to referring the case to the uh, the ethics case to the RCMP, it seems that uh, the government has decided to establish a new Office of Supplier Integrity and Compliance, which will allow the government to better respond to wrongdoing and further safeguard the integrity of federal procurements. The government will also now require full transparency from suppliers about their use of subcontractors and pricing, because I believe when you were doing um, the request for bids, you didn't necessarily have to uh, say whether or not you were going to accomplish the work on your own or whether or not you were just going to subcra- subcontract portions of the work to other people and just manage okay. it. Because it seems that that's what uh, GC Strategies was doing. was They weren't doing much of the IT work of the, on their own. They're saying, but hey, we know how to coordinate these types of projects, so give it to us. And you now we have the contacts and the network to be able to get it done, and we'll manage all of that. Um, so uh, it, it adds a layer of middleman. So basically, they ended up, rather than hiring an IT company to do the work, they ended up, ended up hiring a project manager. Mm. This is essentially what happened here. Um, yeah. Well, hey, good project managers are oh. worth, uh, are, are worth nope. the weight in gold. But That's not up for debate. You, uh, they really are but very that, valuable. That's, but, but that is expertise that you could yes. have in-house. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, no I'm not diminishing. Just hire more. Just pu- understand that. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I know that. Yeah, but I mean, in that case, just hire more public servants and have a bigger department, yeah. rather than contract. I, I am not diminishing the um, work that uh, project managers do. It's very important work. I work with project managers constantly. It's demanding, important work. I just want people to understand. I was not diminishing anybody, but yes, we could have done it in house instead of contracting out. Oh yeah, absolutely. So. Um, the government will now require full transparency from suppliers about their use of subcontract, subcontractors and the pricing. And the way in the government hands out and oversees expensive contracts is also now being reviewed. Um, this, these instances of alleged overbilling were detected due to a mix of tips and advanced data analytics. And Minister Duclos uh, says... This is obviously a troubling outcome, something that we would never want to see. The good news, if there is good news here, is that it shows that the investments in in what we call electronic procurement are starting to work really well because they were able to detect it. TNC bio (laughs) comment. How are we poor architects, software architects, going to triple bill? (laughs) 
Ah, <laughs> damn. That AI's come for you too. <laughs> ah, darn. So, uh, yeah, it will be really, really interesting to see. <laughs> and it seems that the, there will also be uh, an update to a management guide for public services in charge of managing federal contracts. Uh, Anita Anand, who is the Treasury Board President, says that... Uh, uh, she says that the recent reports regarding government contracting as well as the actions of some individuals are very concerning. Um, so that's pretty much a boilerplate statement, but I'm guessing that uh, now that she has to be brought into it, uh, we could probably count on more action mm -hmm. because, well, I mean, it's Anita and not. Yeah, yeah, if you... I'm just saying. Oh, <laughs> These days, that's pretty much all you have yeah. to say. Yeah, Anita's on it. Okay. <laughs> We're in good hands. We are in good hands. Yeah. And the government says that there are another five to 10 cases of procurement fraud that they are looking into right now as well. So there might be more on this story uh, with regards to uh, other departments or other players coming up. So don't be surprised if you hear that there's more because the government is basically telling us that there might be more and that they are looking into it. There you go. Another thing that is happening, we kind of hinted at it uh, a few weeks ago because uh, the conservatives were trying to frame it as the liberals trying to rig the election in their mm -hmm. favor, but there are going to be some changes coming to the Elections Act. I believe the wording has now been tabled in the House of Commons, uh, but this it results from the supply and confidence deal that the liberals engaged in with the new democratic party um we hear about the pharmacare and the dental care and the anti-scab legislation uh, more than anything else because those were the big ticket items but i think there were something like 31 different items mm -hmm. if i'm not mistaken that they had agreed to work on in, in various ways and one of them was um, making elections more accessible for Canadians. So um, it would have things to do like um, adding two advanced voting days to the number of days that we have, um, seeing if the actual election day specifically would rather be uh, three days instead, three consecutive days, uh, and possibly include some time on a weekend, which would make it easier for uh, people to vote. Mm -hmm. It looks like um, that these types of measures do have full support from all of the parties, except, again, from the conservatives. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that there was also going to be some measures to make it such that mail-in voting was better circumscribed. Um, but it... So those are some of the main elements of what's uh, going to be known as as Bill C-65. Uh, it delays two key aspects of the con supply and confidence agreement, however. Uh, one, okay, so spreading the official election day over three days and allowing voters to vote at any Brilliant. polling station in their writing. Yes, it looks like they're going to do that, but this may be in, in place not for the upcoming election, but the one following mm. that. Um, I'm don't, not sure if the, after talking with Elections Canada, they said that that would be too difficult to do in the amount of time that they have Possibly. left because Elections Canada does need, need a certain amount of lead time. And it's a big undertaking. Uh, because when we, right? Yes. Well, because when we were uh, talking about maybe changing the way that we vote in the government's first term, Elections Canada had made it very clear to the federal government that they needed the decision about what they were going to do, if they were going to do anything, about two years before the election so that they could, you know, for example, in uh, proportional representation, we might have had different electoral boundaries or because we would have had certain seats that are not necessarily tied to an electoral district, the balancing out seats, that they would need to have a special ballot design and maybe some uh, wards we drawn, wards, electoral districts were drawn in order to be able to have an election under that system. Under ranked balloting, we could have kept the same electoral boundaries, but we would have needed a different mm -hmm. ballot. And maybe to hire different people for the uh, for the counting, 
because you know the, the count happens in a different way and it's more involved and you count more often. So therefore you might need more people. But you know, Elections Canada has to arrange all the logistics around that. So they do need some lead time. It's not a decision you can make two months before the election and say, here, Elections Canada, make it happen. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a massive undertaking. It's a lot of work, requires more bodies. But the thing is, it will be better for democracy in the end. There are some countries that actually have a holiday on the day of the election. And I've, I saw yep. people yesterday commenting online, well, this is ridiculous. I'm like, why is it ridiculous? Well, you, your employer has to give you four hours off to go and vote. Right. Yes. Because a service industry worker who basically relies on tips to feed and clothe themselves can leave in the middle of a shift to take four hours off to go and vote. And what if they commute into their job? So their commute back and forth takes 90 minutes without traffic mm -hmm. and they have to take basically an hour and a half out of their day to travel to get and stand in line to vote the four hour window might have been good 50 60 years ago it's not yeah. enough today it isn't i don't know yeah we have more people that work at all different hours of the day now more people that are self-employed and more it's a 24 hour seven day a week world right yeah, indeed. Yeah. I mean, if you're self-employed, you're your own employer. You have to give yourself yeah. time. Well, and, and what about the, the, the shift worker who works the midnight yeah. to 6 a.m. shift? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, yes, as I, as I suspected, it was Elections Canada that raised concerns about implementing the latter two reforms that I mentioned, which was the three-day mm -hmm. voting, actual voting period, and voting anywhere in your electoral district. Um, and that's uh, confirmed by both the Democratic Institutions Minister Dominic Leblanc and the NDP Democratic Reform critic Daniel Blakey, who's uh, getting a lot of mentions on our mm -hmm. show uh, yeah. of late, doing a lot of good work. Um, so if past C65, this is according to the CBC, would instead aim to implement those changes by 2029 while asking Canada's chief electoral officer to report back to Parliament on progress towards those changes in the meantime. Dominic Leblanc said it's certainly our hope that those changes could be made sooner. Quote, the principal objective was to improve access to ballots, improve the ability of Canadians to participate in the electoral system, Elections Canada identified some reasonable concerns. Leblanc said allowing voters to cast their ballot at any polling station in the writing would require Elections Canada to adopt new technology so that a person would be removed from the voter list across the district once their ballot is right. cast. So that would prevent someone from going voting. to another polling station in their district with their voting card and saying, hey, I want to vote well, again. Think of because it would appear think everywhere of how much easier that they it would voted be if you can vote anywhere literally so you oh. don't that commute time gone it's gone and some people say well i'll just yep. you know vote when i get home from work well what if your shift ends at i don't know 7 p.m the polls close at nine you have to pick up your kid on the way by the time you get home it's like it's 10 to 9. <sighs> yep and with regard to the three-day voting period, what uh, Elections Canada expressed as a concern was more on an operational basis because it would have to ensure that the buildings that they typically use as polling stations, such as schools and religious centers and stuff of the like, senior centers, would be available for three full days rather than just mm -hmm. one. And they were not be able to; they didn't have enough time to be able to ensure that in all the places across Canada where they're going to have one, because there are many voting stations per right. district in a lot of cases. Um, so, um, you know, everybody said uh, was all, all agreeable that these concerns were understandable. Bill Blakey said, we wanted to be sensitive to those concerns. We wanted to make progress, but do it in a way that's realizable. The legislation does include proposals that, if passed, could be implemented in time for the next election. Those proposals include the addition of two extra days of advanced voting, making the vote on campus program for post-secondary students permanent, finally, Finally, Canadians who wish to vote by mail would also be able to register for a mail-in ballot online and return their ballot to their polling station in person if they miss the mailing deadline. The bill also contains provisions to allow for more flexibility for voting in long-term care facilities. The bill also contains a suite of measures the government says are meant to safeguard election integrity. Those measures include prohibiting political donations made through money orders, yes, prepaid gift cards, yes, and cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. thank you. The government says it would also expand third-party contribution rules to target donations being made by foreign entities, thank mm -hmm. you. 
Current laws about impersonating a candidate would also be expanded to cover artificial intelligence or deep fakes. The bill would make it an offense to make false statements about the electoral process, such as misleading statements about who's allowed to vote and how to register to vote. I'm surprised that was not illegal mm -hmm. already. Federal law requires that the next election be held no later than October 2025. La Blas said the intention is for parliamentarians to ensure that this legislation can be in place as quickly as possible. And the last little thing that's not in this story, but the bill also proposes to change the proposed election date from October 20th, mm -hmm. 2025, to October 27th, 2025. And people are going, oh my God, why, why, why? What's going on? What have they secretly got planned? It's nothing. It's just that October 20th is Diwali. Ah. Uh. Yes. So that would eliminate a, a large portion of the population from showing up. So, yeah. 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 That's all. That's all that's going on. So uh, no big conspiracy, no. no attempt to rig the elections in favor. It's just making it sure that there's more advanced voting days and mail-in voting is better circumscribed. And This is a good thing looking for Looking at democracy. maybe giving us more voting days in the future and making it easier to vote at any polling station in our electoral district and that wouldn't be pardon me something oh, through again gracious me well wow, that's a terrible thing <coughs> you missed the mute missed button the coffin. <laughs> i missed the mute button completely because <laughs> my i had my finger on the thing and i moved coughed your finger yeah the that thing happens. slipped yep moved my finger as it was um and those latter two uh, options wouldn't be a uh, those latter two changes wouldn't be an option until 2029 well so so are the are the are the conservatives going to vote and against no, this? And no change. Do you think yes. they will? Oh, they're probably. Oh, yeah, yeah, and and yeah, because mail-in voting yeah. is the devil. Well, and let's not forget the Remember. Fair Elections Act. Yes, and uh, so and in case you hear it, there is, uh, as you can hear, there is no uh, plan to sort of change some immigration rules to allow people's mm. Canadian citizenships to be approved faster, so that you know liberals can uh, make sure that more of these uh, people coming in to replace white people are eligible to vote geez. in time for the election to buy himself one. That, that, that's another one that's been going that around when this was originally proposed. Yes. <sighs> yes. Yes. They will say anything. Anything to win the men. They will literally say anything. All about winning the <laughs> yeah. so it's literally all about it. Uh, it's really, it's it's just not more complicated than that, unfortunately. Mm. Um, the last little thing that I have for you uh, is with regard to our military. It seems that in order to reverse staffing shortages, the Canadian military is changing two requirements when you're uh, applying to be a member of the Canadian Ar Armed Forces. The first one is uh, called the Canadian Forces Aptitude Test. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Sorry about that. I put something on the um, screen by accident, so, folks, for those of you listening. Ooh. And I missed it because I'm, I'm, I'm reading from oh, notes. Uh, darn. It was just... Ah, darn. Okay, so uh, the first uh, change that it's making uh, to its staffing process is regards the Canadian Forces Aptitude Test, which is a one-hour multiple-choice test intended to assess the candidate's verbal skills, problem-solving, and spatial ability. 60% of people, it seems, who've expressed interest in joining the Canadian Armed Forces changed their minds when they were told they had to take the test. So as part of uh, this uh, pilot project, the test will be scrapped for almost 50 occupations during the application phase. So for occupations such as sailors, gunners, and intelligence officers. But if they pass the application mm -hmm. phase and become members, they will then have to do the forces aptitude test once they right. join up. However, the results will not affect their career. Okay. In terms of uh, if they fail it, they will not. I can't say how they will say it will not affect their career. If they fail it, they probably will not be fired. But I'm sure it's going to have they won't be promoted. Uh, an impact on on potential promotions. Yeah, this is exactly. Uh, the CPC reported uh, a couple of weeks ago that the military is in a crisis because just over half of Canada's military is ready to be deployed. This is according to an internal assessment of the military uh, dated as of uh, as of the end of December. Only 58% of military staff is ready to be deployed or to get a notice to move and act on it. And only 46% of our equipment is considered uh, 
unserviceable mm-hmm. if NATO required us. The military is down 15,700 members. Um, a lot of that uh, had to do with uh, inability to recruit as well as they wanted to during the COVID mm-hmm. phase, uh, but they were having trouble aside from that before that. Um, there's also a funding and spare parts and ammunition shortage. The upcoming budget is expected to cut $79 million from military readiness. There are three separate opinion, public opinion polls recently, which we had reported on, that show that Canadians are becoming a little more concerned about the state of military readiness. About a third of Canadians are now considering military readiness in Canada's place in the world as being one of their top issues. And there's an opportunity here for the straddle, liber, Liberals to straddle the centre and appeal to Red Tories by increasing spending on military readiness while showing a desire for fiscal discipline in other areas, if it wanted to go that route. According to the Minister of Defence, Bill Blair, the force has been losing more people than it has been able to recruit for the past three years. The other change that they plan to make, the first one was the aptitude test. The second it has to do with the medical screening processes. At the moment, we have a one-size-fits-all medical standard, and it's being overhauled. So me, for example, because I have a food allergy, I would not be able to be accepted into the military mm-hmm. because you would assume that when you go on a military campaign somewhere, well, I'm sorry, but we can't yeah, just make sure that, diet, yeah. that, that we have like you know regular flour and then we have gluten-free yeah. flour for you. Right. Uh, That's a little logistically, that's too difficult. Well, it seems that there are going to be a whole bunch of medical conditions such as anxiety, allergies, ADHD or celiac disease, which ruled you out automatically, which now no longer will rule you out for um, uh, jobs within the military that uh, can be done by people that have what's called low risk medical employment limitations. Right now, these people are just instantly screened right. out. So when we were having that uh, uh, that discussion with Army Chris, you know, saying stop trying to appeal to people to join the military for the purposes of diversifying it, because there's only about one percent of Canadians who really want to do that job, but make it easier for the one percent of people who want to do that job do the, to do that job. Well, this is it, because among the one percent of Canadians who want to do that job, some of them might have seasonal allergies, mm-hmm. or some of them might be celiac and whatnot, and you know, or have a slight hearing impairment or something, and so, sorry, you can't be part of the military, we've ruled you out. Well, now there's maybe room mm. for you. Well, and they can find, you know, you might not be deployed in, into a theater of war, right, or combat, but you could be deployed uh, within country to help with maybe a diplomatic mission. Or it, it, there's a million different jobs in the military. It's like my, uh, my seasonal and food allergies would be a, a, a hindrance along with my... Uh, uh, mental health. Right? Let's not give a gun to a guy who has severe depression and anxiety. Yes. You, you might tick more than one box. I know I would. The, 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 the funny <laughs> part is, though, the physical fitness and readiness part, no problem. I can ace that. Yep. The ability to think on yep. your feet and adapt and overcome, I can do that. But I do have other limitations no that, no, nope, sorry. The looking sharp in a uniform part, I can manage. <laughs> well, PNC Bio says right here, there are, there are a million non-combat <laughs> roles, and he's correct. There are so many non-combat roles. But again, you know, they're ruling out people who could be helpful to the military who are not necessarily in a combat position, right? Yep, exactly. Um, so, and it looks like the Defense Department is going to establish an inter- interdisciplinary working group actively looking at other ways to attract candidates as well, or maybe that it already has one established. And so they're looking at other ways because well, previously they had announced things like, for example, if you had a peer steer in your mail, you could probably keep that now. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were allowing uh, women to not only have to wear the skirt, they could wear the, the pants if they wanted it and all that type of stuff. Uh, men being able to have slightly longer hair and all those other things. In as my well. case, I'd be, I'd um, probably get pushed right into 76 com group because I've worked with them for almost 30 years. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. And we're not the, the only country that's having some military uh, considerations. Uh, mm-hmm. Russia, yeah. uh, as we announced is announced that it's going to spend, now spend 6% of its GDP on the military with a view to increase personnel by 30% to 1.5 million units. And in Denmark, Danish Prime Minister Meta Fredriksen has stated that she wants to expand conscription to include women mm. 
in Denmark and increased the time of mandatory service from four months to 11 months. Currently, women who volunteer for service constitute 25% of the military in Denmark, and this change would likely take effect in 2026. Mm, cool. Cool. Well, yeah. So full gender well, equality. Denmark's, Denmark's a, a good country. It's a good place. Scando and uh, Scandinavian, for those of you who don't understand Scando. Oh. And... Uh, yeah, just uh, forward thinking, uh, gender balance, just a good, a good place, a good place. Yep. Mr. Grizzly, we do we indeed, have a show? sir. All right, kids and cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. And because sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless and you have the mouse from which we want the word to be spread kids and cubs please tell your peeps and poops all about us it does us a world of good we really appreciate it when you do and we thank you for all the effort that you do and help from running us and making sure that other people do tune in thank you so very much it's a good thing that you do and if you do not want to miss an episode well you do not have to no, 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 no. Thanks to the Ray Girl, a member of our wonderful and beautiful damn fam, who sponsors our pod page site. So if you scan that QR code that is underneath my chin, that will bring you directly there. And if you are listening, you go to podpage.com slash the true North Eager Beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. If you would like to support us in other ways, then you just have to make like Kit Lane and go to our True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page where we have buttons for you to do. Hey, what you do with them is your business. But we don't mind it when you tweak our buttons. Kind of makes us happy. Monkey. Gives us a little warm fuzzy. <laughs> so if you would like this beaver to feel this be beaver's fuzzy to be all warm, well then you click on like, you click on share, and you click on subscribe, and you let us know that you have joined the damn fam, because then we see our numbers go up. See, that's how it works. And every time you see a number scrap up, you get happy beaver. And happy beaver is always Everybody a good thing. Everybody likes a happy beaver. Yeah. <laughs> so like, share, subscribe. Thank you so much. We love it. We love it when you do that. And if you would like to support us in any other ways, oh, Kit Jen, you're being saucy with the emojis. <laughs> you can go to that QR code that's right by Mr. Grizzly's head right there. And that will bring you to our coffee page where you will find the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. And there you can contribute a little bit if you've got some uh, toonies and loonies jangling in your pocket. And uh, that will make sure that we remain hydrated to be able to present this show to you. Help us uh, with a hot chocolate or a coffee or maybe even a Caesar and a Guinness for your favorite beaver and grizzly duo. So if you appreciate the work that we do and you appreciate our content, we appreciate hearing from you. If you are not able to donate to the emergency hydration fund, no worries. Don't worry whatsoever. Because the gift of your attention is the one that really matters to us. And there's our mascot, Lola, looking so lovely and giving kisses to her human. Good girl. Oh, she's so good cute. Good girl. She's such a cutie. I love her so much. I can't wait to meet her. Camera, look oh, camera, look um, <laughs> I'm distract distracted by Doggo. Okay, new rule. Nobody cuter than me is allowed on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Even I'm sold. <laughs> Don't lick my earring. Oh man, she's such a cutie. I, I love, love that. Too. She's she just wants to be loved. Just look at that face. Oh, <laughs> hey there, puppy. Hey, Lola. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. oh, that that was an industrial size. Oh, yeah. Right oh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Sweetheart. All right. Yeah. So if you make a contribution to our hydration fund at coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters with uh, no hyphens uh, in those words and no spaces, just lowercase letters all in one word, we would appreciate it very much. Because democracy is something that you do. Please put pen to paper and write those letters to your MPs, your MPPs, your MLAs, your senators, and members of the media. Tell them that you demand better and that you want better coverage. Yeah. And that you want better policy. 
and you want better candidates. Or better yet, call your elected representative and ask them for a meeting. But if there's something that really matters to you, please put it to paper. It matters. It really matters, and it helps a lot. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, kits and cubs. <laughs> so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Yes, Kit Tabby G. Yes, yes, Mr. Grizzly may have the pupper, but I have my pet flies. Pet <laughs> flies, oh yeah. <laughs> Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom for the kits and cubs yeah, today? I do. Oops, sorry, my cord is thing here. I do, I do, uh, but I'm going to let somebody else say it here, so I think you'll enjoy this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, it got Kajungo. He had a second chance and still Porky pigged it. <laughs> <laughs> but also notice, right, like this, he just like like literally pushed him aside and then went to shaking the next person's mm -hmm. hand because he knew he wasn't going to win the clap back battle the second he's time. Not, he's not very smart. He's temperament, again, as Charles Adler mm -hmm. put it, temperamentally unfit yes. for the job he seeks. Absolutely. All right, got to go. I got to get to the yes. office. Roll the credits, please. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music.